Good evening again, everyone. The hounds of censorship are off and running again, and this time the target is those blood and guts movies that count on screens to bring in dollars. This past weekend, three Los Angeles television stations refused to carry commercials for Brian De Palma's Dress to Kill, except during restricted time periods. The so-called offensive scenes showed Michael Caine dressed as a woman about to attack Angie Dickinson with a razor. But what is causing an even greater furor is the Los Angeles Times' refusal to carry any advertising for a film called Maniac. The Times states, and we quote, the film has no socially redeeming value whatsoever, and it is our duty to the community we serve not to encourage even indirectly such violence, end quote. This response has Maniac director William Lustig furious. He calls it censorship and has found support within the community from actors Roy Scheider and Stacey Keach, producer Bruce Gilbert of 9 to 5, and director William Friedkin of The Exorcist. They all sent telegrams to the Times protesting its action. Yet this kind of censorship seems almost inevitable considering the flow of blood and guts films, which has glutted the marketplace in recent years. While it is possible to argue the artistic merit of films such as Psycho and The Exorcist, a new breed of shriek merchants has exploited the once honorable genre of the terror film. Most followers of this genre point to a 1978 film called Halloween as the vehicle which opened the bloody floodgates at the box office. This critically acclaimed movie directed by John Carpenter grossed more than $50 million since its release. But unfortunately, it has spawned a host of imitations bearing such gruesome titles as Blood Beach and My Bloody Valentine. And now virtually not a week goes by without another scare movie making its appearance. Such popularity raises one important question. What is the appeal of these films? Studies have shown that the primary audience for these movies are thrill-seeking teenagers and minority groups. Maniac director Bill Lustig says white middle-class America is staying home from theaters except for special events like The Empire Strikes Back and is instead watching movies on cable TV leaving the local theaters to blacks, Latinos, and other minorities without the financial resources to tap into the home video market. Why do horror films appeal to minority groups? Well, Lustig says it's because the movies rely heavily on visual impact and therefore language is not a problem. But many parents and civic groups see these films in a more sinister light, calling them the new pornography. And certainly films with exploitative titles like blood-sucking freaks are hard to defend, although in most cases the titles are more lurid than the movies themselves. However, the fascination with freakiness may be fading. At a recent preview of Friday the 13th, Part 2, at a Hollywood Boulevard theater, the audience openly booed this particular coming attraction. This could mean the issue of censorship will take care of itself in a free marketplace where the audience chooses what it wants to see and therefore, in its own way, dictates what gets made. This is certainly preferable to local, state, or federal censorship, which a very vocal portion of this country is now supporting. And tomorrow, Coast to Coast will continue after these messages.
I think I'll buy a new car. Uh, say, Melly, how long have I had the old one? One year, eight months, 14 days, 11 minutes, 43 seconds. Three o'clock, boss. Time to go home. So it is. Well, I'm ready. Yeah, long day, 11 to 3, two hours for lunch, three days a week. It's a tough life. <laughs> License number WJK-412. I did three hearts, three no trump. I passed. Do you mind if I pass? <laughs> Certainly not. Go right ahead. Thanks. <laughs> Out about it. This bus is a little old fashioned. Well, that was delicious. That concludes tonight's thrilling episode of our three-dimensional western, brought to you by Energade, the combination soft drink, candy, and dessert with the three-dimensional flavor. Good, good, good. Buy it at your local market. Twenty-first century cars present. Hello, folks. Say that. Now we are going to bring you a special entertainment feature which will show the development of the automobile. Oh, Pop! I want to see another cowboy picture. Quiet. I beg your pardon. Oh, n not you. <laughs> Say, those new models look terrific. They are terrific. You should see what your grandfather used to call an automobile. Okay, Sam, start the show. Now, folks, believe it or not, this is actually an automobile. When Grandpa was a 17-year-old hot rodder around the turn of the century, this job was the hottest thing on wheels. Grandpa's newfangled horseless carriage changed his whole life in more ways than one. Motoring was a thrilling experience even in those days. Since there weren't any doors in Grandpa's dream boat, Sometimes it was a little too thrilling. Every trip was an adventure in those days, and one thing you could always depend on. A flat tire. The old retaining rings on the rims didn't always retain what they were supposed to retain. Shock absorbers hadn't been invented yet. 
and road conditions were ideal for testing the fatigue and failure points of automobiles and drivers. Grandpa's car didn't have much acceleration for passing, so he found himself on the wrong side of the road for longer than he should be. Caught out at night, Grandpa's gas or oil headlamps weren't much competition for a couple of fireflies. The little speedster had no top, and it was far from comfortable in an unexpected shower. The windshield was a great improvement. But without a wiper, even Grandpa's 20-20 vision couldn't keep him out of trouble. The runabout didn't have a self-starter, and often the 10-horsepower engine didn't respond to the hand crank. Occasionally, even on good roads, individual parts failed without warning. Axles snapped. When drag links and steering knuckles failed, it was hard to tell what might happen. With every passing year, improvements came thick and fast. Stronger and safer wheels were developed with demountable rims for tires. Doors were added to keep people safely inside. Tops became standard equipment. Windshields protected motorists from bugs and the elements. Wipers were invented to help the motorist drive safely in bad weather. The driver's seat was moved from right to left to make passing safer. The electric starter replaced the old hand crank. This remarkable invention enabled Grandma to get into the automobile driving act. And she really loved it. As the years went by, the automobile manufacturers continued to improve their cars and make them safer so that more and more people could use and enjoy them. Press steel wheels for greater strength, stoplights to warn following drivers, rear view mirrors, four wheel hydraulic brakes to increase stopping power, bumpers to add more protection, rubber covered pedals to keep feet from slipping, Safety glass increased passenger protection tremendously. Welded all steel bodies and all steel tops meant more strength and safety. Bumpy roads were smoothed out with shock absorbers and Grandpa could sail along in comfort and safety. Through the years, the automobile changed from a novelty to a necessity. It created a new way of life. It provided a whole new concept of transportation for industry. And we became a nation on the move for work and pleasure. Besides designing better automobiles, the manufacturers developed research and testing techniques to help them build safer cars. The science of metallurgy met the challenge of creating more efficient and stronger parts and assemblies. Scientists used all kinds of technical equipment in research and development programs. Ingenious torture tests were designed to reveal fatigue and failure points in parts and assemblies. And like the parts and assemblies, the cars themselves were tested under all kinds of driving conditions make sure that they would operate with maximum efficiency and safety. At the end of the rugged test run on the proving grounds, they were disassembled down to the last bolt and checked and studied in minute detail. Year after year, manufacturing processes steadily improved. To make sure that every automobile that left the factory was in good working order, each car was subjected to more than 2,000 inspections cars became safer and more reliable. So when Grandpa, still plenty spry in spite of his age, set out for a little trip, his car was reliable, safe, comfortable, and easy to drive. Safety door locks kept Grandpa secure inside the all-steel body. The adjustable seat quickly placed him in a comfortable position. The automatic transmission made driving easier and easier controls meant safer driving. Styling contributed to safety. The low center of the gave more stability. 
tubeless tires meant increased safety. New equipment kept Grandpa warm in the winter and cool in the summer to add to his comfort. And a more comfortable driver was a safer driver. More powerful and reliable engines were developed to make driving more efficient. When Grandpa passed another car, he did it safely and easily. Wrap-around windshields and larger rear windows increased visibility tremendously. Sealed beam headlamps guided Grandpa safely at night. Power brakes made it possible for him to stop easily and quickly. Directional signals let the other fellow know the driver's intentions. Power steering not only made parking a breeze, it made all driving easier. Even in the good old days of the 1950s and 1960s, Grandpa could rely on his automobile to get him to his destination quickly, safely, and fresh as a daisy. So you see, folks, all of you who are living in the year 2000 are fortunate because through the years, the automobile manufacturers have had as their goal your safety first. They have constantly improved the quality and safety of automobiles and they will continue in the future as they have in the past to create cars that are more maneuverable, more responsive, more dependable in every situation, and easier, more pleasant, and safer for all of us to drive, including, of course, Grandpa. That's the ding-dong truth. Look at me going on 117. It's this easy modern living that does it. Well, so long, kids. Gotta go pick up another new model. Right now, at this very moment, as you watch these light rays striking the magnified eye, similar tiny beams of light are entering your own eyes. And it's by our eyes that we are able to gain a great part of our knowledge. Nature has located the eye close to the brain so that its messages may arrive there quickly. Nature has also provided ample protection for this very delicate organ. Here, with the outer coverings removed, we see the eyeball completely surrounded by a layer of soft, fatty tissue and placed within the bony orbit, where it lies protected against sudden jolts. Seen from the side, the protected position of the eyeball within its funnel-shaped eye socket is shown still more clearly. Once again, we see the fatty cushion which protects it on all sides. Note this white stalk, which is the optic nerve, and also these muscles which move the eyeball. This is the empty eye socket within the skull, with its bony walls inside and the rim of the bony orbit in front. By gradually restoring the outer portions of the skull and also the covering tissues, we can now realize the location of the entire eye in relation to the outline of the face. Another important safeguard to the eye is the tear gland which secretes the tear fluid. This is an effective germicide which drains through the tear ducts into the nose after flushing and cleaning the entire eye surface. The eyeball itself has a white, glistening surface. Its front part bulges and forms a highly transparent window. In this sectional view, the capsule of the eyeball is seen to have three layers. This thick, tough outer layer is called the sclera and serves to protect the delicate structures within. This transparent bulging portion is called the cornea. Notice also the crystalline lens, which is one of the main features of the eye mechanism. The second layer is called the choroid. It consists of three different belts or zones. The first zone is called the choroid proper and is the part that carries nourishment to the tissues of the eye. The next zone is called the ciliary body. This is a broad ring-shaped band of thin muscle fibers which play a very active and vital part in the visual adjustment of the eye.
The third zone is the well-known iris, which expands and contracts the pupil, much like the diaphragm of a camera. The iris will soon be described in greater detail. Here is an outside view of the entire choroid, which shows the dense network of arteries and veins carrying nourishment to the eyeball. You can also see the shape of the ciliary body and the iris. The innermost layer of the eyeball is the retina, a very delicate membrane. The retina is actually a part of the optic nerve which transmits the light impulses to our brain. The retina is the most important and complex structure in the eyeball. Magnified many hundred times, the retina is seen to consist of this complicated arrangement of rods and cones, which convert light waves into nerve impulses in some manner which even science of today cannot fully explain. Between the lens and the cornea is the aqueous humor, consisting mostly of water and a little salt. This larger space within the eye is filled with the vitreous humor or body, consisting chiefly of water with some salt and albumin. The vitreous humor is really a highly transparent jelly and plays a very important part in the act of visual adjustment. Thus, light rays entering the eye must pass in succession through first the cornea, second the aqueous humor, third the pupil, fourth the crystalline lens, and fifth the vitreous humor in order to reach their destination, the retina. Now, just how do light rays act to form a clear picture within the eye? First, let us realize that light rays reflected from any object radiate in all directions, and that as an object moves farther away from us, the angle between the rays that enter our eyes grows smaller and smaller. And finally, when the object has reached a distance of 15 feet or more, the rays entering our eyes are practically parallel. Now, nature has provided that parallel rays shall produce a sharp image upon the retina without any effort, and as one may say, with the eye in a state of complete relaxation. But if a distant object approaches the eye, the angle between entering rays again grows larger. This increasing angle changes the direction of the light rays as they pass through the lens, so that the sharp image falls behind the retina. As a result, the image upon the retina tends to become blurred. This blurring causes a response or reflex within our brain, which brings about harmonious internal adjustments of all parts of the eye. This adjustment is called accommodation. Accommodation restores the sharply focused image with marvelous speed and accuracy. This is all the more remarkable because the distance between lens and retina is fixed, and the lens itself must change its shape. Now compare this with the focal adjustment of a camera. Here the lens remains unchanged, but the film itself is moved until it reaches a sharp focal image. It is also necessary that both our eyes be fixed upon the same point in order that we may see an object clearly. Thus, as an object approaches us from a distance, our eyeballs turn accordingly. This movement is called the convergence of visual axes. This action is shown here as the object approaches and recedes. Here, in addition, we see the lenses accommodating their optical shape under the combined influence of blurred image and eyeball movement. And now let us look at this highly enlarged view of the lens itself. It has a soft, yielding body and is as transparent as glass. But it also has a firm, ball-shaped central core or nucleus. It is contained within a thin, elastic membrane and is suspended all around by a spoke-like arrangement of delicate threads or ligaments. The lens itself lies between two liquids. These liquids can exert pressure. All liquids cannot be compressed. You may ask then, how is this soft, pliable body of the lens made to take on 
the different degrees of convexity necessary for accommodation. In order to explain this, let us again call attention to the important ciliary muscle which we see here in the diagram. This muscle is shaped like a broad ring which can expand and contract. Whenever it does contract, it must press upon the non-elastic vitreous humor. This liquid is confined within the rigid capsule of the eyeball and must, therefore, exert pressure upon the lens. Now, the lens as a whole cannot give way against the equally non-elastic aqueous humor and its confining cornea. So the only part which can possibly yield to the pressure of the vitreous humor, or body, is the soft substance of the lens. This lens substance is thus molded into an even curve against the rigid ball-shaped core, thus forming this highly convex bulge, which science is called lenticonus. So whenever the image upon the retina becomes blurred, the brain automatically causes the ciliary muscle to contract or to relax until the lens has attained just the right shape to restore a sharply defined image upon the retina. This is the remaining portion of the choroid, called the iris, with its central opening, the pupil. Like the diaphragm of a camera, the iris regulates the amount of light and sharpens the image upon the retina. The iris acts automatically, and so is an important link in the process of accommodation. Its action is caused by two sets of delicate muscle fibers within the iris itself. These muscles are shown here in simplified diagram. These spoke-like radial fibers pull the pupil open. This ring-shaped muscle around the pupil closes it. In this side view, we see the opening and closing of the pupil so that we may more clearly understand another important part played by the iris. Whenever demanded by conditions, the lens acquires this peculiar bulge called lenticonus. This cone-shaped curve at first causes light rays to become distorted into aberrations upon the retina. As a result of these distortions, the pupil now contracts until the diffused rays have been shut away and only a clear image remains upon the retina. These interesting mechanics of the lens are not generally known and the facts presented here have only recently been accepted by science. It is well for us to know that our eyes are one of our greatest gifts of nature and are indeed worthy of our constant care and protection. You know, life is getting pretty complicated. Each of us is so busy with his own affairs, oh, raising a family, making a living, and keeping house, that sometimes we lose sight of what's going on right around us. Of course, we try to keep up with things through the newspapers, the radio, television, and so on, but uh, what do you think about when you read something like this? Wanna be where? Parents, too. So, well, maybe. And uh, what about this? Shameful. Somebody ought to do something. Somebody? Somebody, yes. But that somebody is you, I, each one of us. We ought to do something about a lot of the things that are wrong in our city.
At Luigi's Italian Deli and Meat Market, we offer only one kind of food, the best. Luigi's has taste-tempting selections of imported specialties from Italy. Their Italian-style veal cutlets and homemade Italian sausage and full line of fresh meats are of the best quality. For a snack or a feast, Luigi's has fresh Italian bread, rolls, butter, and milk. They also have freezer plans. Come to Luigi's Italian Deli and Meat Market, open seven days a week. 424 Dover Road, South Toms River. You're watching Sleepcore, Pleasant Dreams. Okay, this is Margaret. Uh, Margaret, is this your first rave? No, it isn't. Okay, you're a raver? Well, I guess you can say it's fun. Uh, how does tonight's rave compare with some of the raves you've been to in the past? Um, well, around here, I think the... There's more energy. More energy? Did more you energy, positive, you know. Okay. It's really good. And, uh, Loda, is this your first race? No. And how, does, uh, how do you uh, feel tonight compared to the rest of the race? I'm is usually a club party? blower. What? I, I'm usually a club blower. So. Translate, what'd you say? She's usually a club goer. Uh, okay. Uh, why do you come to race? To have fun and party, why else? And, uh, Barda, what's your name? It is Mark. Mark. And, uh, what am I doing here? Um, I'm a socialite. Socialite. Debbie Bob. Okay, this is, uh, Barbara and Jason. And, uh, let's see, uh, Barbara, what brings you to the rave? The crowd. Take a the guess. The music, the music, the techno. We're having fun now. This is Shelly. Shelly uh, uh, Shelly is a model. Uh, in fact, Shelly has a model in agency. Uh, uh, Diva in Scottsdale. Right. Right. I knew that. I knew that. And uh, Shelly said that if I mentioned it, she would supply me with unlimited girls. Did you not say that? Come on. Come oh, on of Pedro. course I did. I mean, for the show. And uh, this is Bray. And uh, Bray, this is not your first uh, rave. No. Uh, as well. And. Uh, the term that you use, raver. Right. Somebody who has attended more than one rave is a raver. Right. Okay. So you're a raver. You're a raver. She's a raver. She's a raver. I'm a raver too. All right. This is Amy, and Amy's a raver. Yes. And Amy is a uh, inspiring actress. Oh yeah. I'm. That's what I'm gonna be. You're gonna do it. You're gonna yes. do it. And uh, Kyra. Yes. Kyra is a designer. Now I don't know, uh, Jerry, if we can get a shot of uh, this outfit. Turn around, Kyra. Okay. This is body paint on here. Okay. And uh, Kyra, Kyra is an up-and-coming designer, and she hopes to be a leading designer in the 21st century, she tells me. Yes, I do. What are you telling your words? Um, I do very avant-garde fashion to keep it in the rave scene, um, make fashions fun, and wearable. Okay, uh, this is Joanna, and welcome to my show, Joanna. Oh, hi, how are you? Yeah, I'll, I'll hold the mic. I'll hold oh, okay, the mic. I'm uh, Tell me something about yourself. Are you a raver? Uh, yes, I am. I, well, I consider myself as just an art individual who sees certain things. If I see this, I'll look at it as an elephant, but I won't be tripping on acid or anything. I just no, have no, the no. natural, natural.
natural art mine. Natural art mine, and I just love junk. I love junk like this. I just made it out of a little. I was walking in the alley and I found it and I put it on. So have it's you just, worn this? Uh, this is before? pirate. Oh no, I haven't. This is totally original. Oh yeah. Don't lie to me, Joanna. It's totally original. I uh, shall never lie. There's no reason to lie. Turn around. Let, lie. let us see what you look like. Uh, okay, this time I bring you Fancy Free. Welcome to my show, Fancy Free. Thank you. And uh, Marquis de Pump. Hello. And John. David Van Burden. David, David, How do you do? And uh, David, David's a columnist. Uh, uh, tell me something about your publishing. I publish a, a publication called The Year Report. We uh, cover the nightlife scene in Phoenix. Clubs, raves, parties, glamorous social affairs. Okay, uh... Oh, we haven't fun yet, people. Oh, we haven't fun yet. Absolutely. Oh, we haven't fun? Oh, yeah. I think we're having more than fun. Well, I don't know about them, but I'm having a great time. And uh, as you can see, all kinds of people attend these raids. And that's really, as I thought in the beginning, and I'm finding out more and more, that's really the most interesting thing about a raid. It's the interesting people. And that's the same to be said to any function. It's the interesting people that attend it. Uh, that being said, anything you want to say, Fancy Free? Anything, anything you want to say? Uh, Get punk. No. David. Hello, all those glamorous people out there. Okay, this is this is Alex. Uh, Alex is a local here, and Alex makes a makes a lot of raves. So you made, you've attended quite a few raves. Yeah. yeah. And what brings you to the raves? Um. Talk to the camera. Mostly because my friends are here. And it's a fun thing to do. Yeah. It, people in need. Well, I don't yeah. want to put words in your mouth. It's gotten really stupid now, but I used to like it, and now I just come because there's nothing else to do. Okay. Can you see through the, can you see through the pants? Get it, get it close up. Put that light on, get it close up. Do you want me to bend over? Uh, can you bend over? No, not, let's see. Bend over this way. Hey, Sean, come here. Give me a shot. Okay, now turn around this way. Put your hands on his shoulders this way. And bend down this way. Bend down, 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 this way. Get a shot, get a shot. Quick, quick, before she passes out. And do you have us? We're having fun now. We're cooking now, partner. Tracy and Charity, have a little business they call Funky Junk. And I'll let them explain exactly what that is. What Funky Junk is, we sell rave necklaces. We um, create necklaces at home, we make them homemade, and we sell them and we create them for individualists. So whoever comes up to our concession stand and wants a necklace such as one like this, they can get can, one. Can you get a picture of this, dear? <laughs> now this is Funky Junk. This is Okay. Now, uh, not everything you make are necklaces. Yes. The, uh, the, this is a part. Get a picture of this too, Jer. Get a better picture here, Jer. <laughs> now, uh, this is your first raid. Yep. And uh, by now, my viewers know it's my first raid, but it's going to be the first of many. And uh, you're, you're not from the Phoenix area. You tell me you're from. I just moved here from Illinois about a month and a half ago. And, uh, a psych major? Uh, yeah, I was a student at uh, Southern Illinois University for three and a half years. I was a psych major, and I dropped out to move here and experience the rave. <laughs> and uh, see, can we get the uh, the nose piercing and the lip piercing? And the tongue piercing. Get a close-up of that tongue, Jim. Let's have that tongue again. Give us the tongue. You got a close-up of that? Okay. And, uh, and we have a special, special Pearson that will appear on a future show that we won't show now. We'll keep them guessing. Wanted for murder. Six beliefs. One. Two. Five. Six. These public, they are ideas and beliefs. 
murderous beliefs which can lead to tragedy. These beliefs kill more than 80,000 people each year, enough to fill a huge college football stadium. Every year, there are millions of people badly hurt, many of them crippled. One of these beliefs may be about to murder you, so look closely. Do you believe safety is for sissies? I saw you stretched out down there on the field after that pile up. I thought you were hurt real bad. Yeah, could have been worse, though. Uh, you're pretty lucky. I guess so. Yeah. Well, we'll see you. See you. Fun, okay, see you. Jim, how's the shoulder? Pretty good, thanks. Well, tough luck, but Coach tells me you didn't want to take time to get a new shoulder pad when you're starting to go, and I didn't want to take time out just to play safe. Well, safety is a pretty important thing, too, Jim. Maybe, but I didn't want the other fellows to think I'm a sissy. Well, you proved your point, but I wonder if the price you paid was worth it. By the way, we're having a meeting of the aviation club this afternoon, having a test pilot come out to give us a talk. Are you going to be there? Sure will. I think you'll find it enlightening. about all there is to it. Any questions? Isn't it terribly dangerous? Well, it does have its moments, but every precaution is taken to see that the aircraft is fit and the pilots always try and meet any emergency that may come up. Test pilots don't wear parachutes, do they? We certainly do. One in front and one in back. But, well... Uh, yes? Well, I thought you guys were supposed to be really brave and... Whoa there, young fella. Now remember one thing. There's a big difference between bravery and foolhardiness. Sure, I'd rather not be all rigged up in bulky chutes, but I'll wear or use anything that'll make my job safer. And that goes for all pilots. We're not cowards, but we're not fools either. We've got a dangerous job to do, and the safer we play it, the better we can do it. Don't be foolish. Safety is for everybody. Stop being a victim of this belief that safety is for sissies. It's a murderous belief. This belief can kill, too. Do you believe accidents happen only when your number is up? That things are determined by fate, or just because that's the way the ball bounces? One of these girls is guilty of this murderous belief. Judy, this is just what I've been looking for, except in pale blue. If they have it in the right color, I think I'll try it on. Maybe we'd better wait until some other time. It's getting late, and driving home in rush hour is no fun. Dangerous, too. Oh, don't be silly. We'll be all right. If your number's up, you'll get hit. And if it isn't, you won't. Look, isn't that Bob Prentice across the street? Oh, yes, it is. Maybe he wants a ride home. I'll go ask. <laughs> foolish belief in fate cost her her life. She didn't get killed because her number was up. Her murderous belief killed her. Here's another murderous belief. Do you believe accidents happen because of a law of averages? Do you believe that a mathematical chance is more important than what you do and actually determines whether or not you have an accident? Looks interesting, Dad. What's it going to be? Well, these are the leg pieces for that lawn chair in the do-it-yourself book out there, Billy. They've all got to be the same size, so we'll line them up and saw them off together. Can I try it? Oh, no. We'll give you some experience with hand tools first, then you can try the power tools. I'll be careful. Yeah, I know. That's what all the guys say. Most of them get hurt trying to do it themselves before they know how. I just saw some figures on that in my math class. Do you know that only 2% of all the people in the country get hurt in accidents? The law of averages is with me. I won't get hurt. 
Let me try it. Oh, no, not this time, Billy. There. Now we're all set. Hey, where's the guard? Oh, we don't need it for this, Bill. That law of averages you talked about will take care of me. Look out there. There's your law of averages for you. This belief doesn't take care of anything or anyone. Many who believe in the law of averages pay the price through carelessness. Bill's carelessness cost him just a hurt hand this time. But faith in the law of averages can be murder. Put it out of your mind. This belief can lead to murder too. Today, more and more people try to use the price of progress as an excuse for their own laziness and carelessness. For this reason, it's wanted for murder. Do you believe accidents are part of the price of progress? There you are, Mom. All set. Now you won't have to go over to the table to turn the radio off and on. This remote control switch will let you do it right from the sink. Say, that looks pretty good, son. You sure it'll work? Yes, sir. I just took the wires, bypassed the switch in the radio, and hooked them into this switch. Made it myself. Well, it's wonderful to have an electrician in the house to keep us up on the latest scientific advancements. Let's see how your little gadget works. Are you all right, dear? Yes, I guess so. But it was quite a shock. Gee, I'm awfully sorry, Mom. I should have made sure everything was properly insulated and grounded. I guess that's a price of progress sometimes. Nonsense. If you had been careful and done the job right in the first place, this wouldn't have happened. Why, well, your mother might have been seriously hurt. And the price of progress is no excuse. Right. Don't blame your carelessness on the price of progress. Progress has cut down the death rate in tuberculosis and is on the way to the conquest of cancer. Progress has given you all that you see around you in the way of comforts and entertainment. The same attention to safety that we give to progress will give us more progress with more safety. Don't blame accidents on progress when the real blame lies with you and your beliefs. And put this belief out of your mind too. Accidents don't always happen to the other fellow. Do you believe they do? I just had a big lunch about an hour ago. This sure tastes good. Mmm, I ate a big lunch too, but I can always force down something good. Mom says she doesn't know how I do it. Come on, let's go try those dyes we've been practicing. Not me, I'm too full. And you'd better wait a while too. It's not good to go in the water so soon after eating. Might get a cramp. Oh, I've done it lots of times and I never had a cramp. had? That's something that always happens to someone else, not to me. lucky. She knows someone now who's had a cramp while swimming, and all she paid for the knowledge was a little pain. The other fellow can be you. Stop this belief on sight and put it out of your mind. It can be a killer. Do you think you're lucky like this driver? Did you see him breeze through the four-way stop at that intersection? If that other car hadn't stopped, the driver's luck would end right there smart passenger. He's getting out. I'm through right here, Harry. What are you scared of, Johnny? You're driving. That's what I'm scared of. Didn't you see that stop sign back there? Sure, I saw it, but the other car was stopped. So why should I? Well, suppose somebody came along that figured the same way. He could have plowed right into you. Not me, Johnny. I'm lucky. I'm not. I'll walk and be sure I get where I'm going. No more racing trains to crossings or going through stop signs for me. Ah. Johnny's words aren't making any impression on Harry. Look at the needle climb up that speedometer dial. Uh-oh, there's a dangerous curve warning up ahead. Look out, Harry. That curve's sharper than you think. Lucky <laughs> is another name for foolishness. Anytime you believe you feel lucky, 
look out for murder. It can happen to you unless you take these six beliefs and throw them out of your mind and out of your life. Wanted for murder, six beliefs. The belief that safety is for sissies, that no matter what you do, your number will come up. The belief that you're protected by some dream called the law of averages. The belief that accidents are the price of progress. The belief that accidents only happen to the other fellow and the belief that an accident can't happen to you because you're lucky. What can these six murderous beliefs promise you except a moment of carelessness followed by tragedy or death? Blot them out of your sight and out of your mind. You'll live longer. Тетя, сад, сядь. Девиц, девиц, шептать, широк, шары. Рысак, рысака, русак, русака. Рысак, 
огород, дома, домовая, дымовая. Огород, дома, дымовая, дымовая. Гроза, грозовая, грузовая. Гроза, грозовая, грозовая. Глуб, глубь, пат, пят, пьян. Глуп, глубь, пат, пят, пьян. Прав, прав, завод, зовет, зовет. Жар, жар, рад, ряд, рьян. Жар, жар, рад, рьян, рьян. Садком, садкем, хол, хил. Жок, сжок, дождем, дождемся. Заплетший, отчий. 
Бог дал два уха, а один язык. Бог дал два уха, а один язык. Галок попугая увидел в клетке попугая. Галок попугая увидел в клетке попугая. Ртом болезнь входит, а беда выходит. Ртом болезнь входит, а беда выходит. Sleepcore will return, 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 return. 
You're watching Sleepcore, media for insomnia. There, miss. You see, the heterodynes were feeding back into the stimulus reaction activators, causing non-synapse of the motor control resistor units. Oh, that's good. No, lady, that's bad. But your regenerative circuits are tuned asynchronously, and that causes concatenation in the intermediate amplifiers. Well, that's bad, isn't it? No, that's good. From now on, I don't think there'll be the slightest trouble with your robot. Your domestic problems are completely solved. Well, thank you very much. Well, that's perfectly all right. And if there's anything else you want to know about your robot, don't hesitate to give us a ring. Good day. Rolo, answer the door. Yes, Rollo the robot, the chromium-plated butler, is just a daydream after all. But not so Rollo's little brother and sister robots, the millions of small mechanical servants that never ask for afternoons off, the amazing machines and gadgets that almost seem to think for themselves. The tiny clockwork brains and heat regulators on our kitchen stoves apparently do almost everything except read the cookbook. Thinking machines like this keep golden brown slices of toast from turning into slabs of charcoal and keep the coffee hot until we're ready to start dunking. Then there's a tea kettle that's been trained never to boil dry. When the water is gone, the kettle simply pulls out its own attachment plug. And here's a gadget that ought to raid a bowl from every dog in the country. A Fido feeder that never forgets when the pup is dining home alone and the rest of the family is dining out. What's more, it tells him when to come and get it. In offices and schoolrooms, too, robots have learned to turn on the lights. This little electric eye measures the amount of daylight coming in the windows. When the light level outside drops below the requirement for good visibility, this robot throws a switch and the first bank of lights goes on. No robot machine has ever been accused of being absent-minded or careless at its work. Here, a robot that never sleeps nor winks nor looks out the window stands guard over the men who work at this giant press. 
As long as the robot can see the man, the press won't budge an inch. And that's mighty important on a big job like this. Did you ever hear of anyone getting his lap caught in an elevator door? That can't happen here, because as long as there's anything in the way, this door can't close. Step back, please. There's plenty of room in the rear of the car. All right, then, don't step back. Just take a deep breath and hang on to yourself. One little robot, for example, always remembers to serve drinks when it sees anyone walking around with a thirst. A beam of light is aimed across the fountain and into an electric eye. When the beam of light is broken by a solid object, such as this head, the electric eye control opens the faucet and there's your drink. This particular device is an automatic fire sprinkler. Someday, maybe someone will invent a robot that can take a joke. Some robots have even learned to fly. Tiny automatic brains in giant airliners, sensitive to the slightest change in balance or direction, relieve the busy pilots of the job of keeping the wings level, the nose on the horizon, and the plane headed in the right direction. Don't look now, but this motor car is simply full of robots. In the carburetor is a diet specialist, a brainy collection of jets and valves and floats that serve a health menu of gasoline calories and fresh air vitamins to the engine, a menu that varies with every change in speed or load. The engine likes its meals served not too hot and not too cold. So in the intake manifold, another mastermind with a nervous system sensitive to heat uses hot exhaust gases to warm the mixture before it goes into the engine. Step right up close to the platform and see the Siamese robots. These robots attached to the distributor are always worrying about the spark in the engine. One is sure that the spark ought to be advanced. The other is equally sure that it ought to be retarded just a trifle. But they never argue. Each takes his turn according to the speed and load. And between them, they manage to stage a grand performance every time they go on the road. One little robot a very small but intelligent brain sits up back of the engine in the voltage regulator and keeps close tabs on the generator to see that the generator makes enough current to keep the battery fully charged, but not too full. And still another deep thinker rides way up in front. Its job is to keep water from cooling off in the radiator until the engine is warmed up to a good working temperature. Then in the vacuum power gear shift, there's a robot strongman who thrives on almost nothing at all. With a bit of a vacuum, this sturdy fellow can almost shift for himself, if we'll just tell him what we want him to do. Robots have even taken up the art of dial twisting in our radios. All we need to do is push the button and listen. Driving wouldn't be half so much fun if we didn't have that phantom crew of intelligent robots to help us. Every day, in our homes and offices, as well as in our motor cars, hundreds of these little robots are doing more things for us than we realize, taking care of the routine tasks and leaving us free to live and work and play in greater ease and comfort and safety. Thank you. That's what we are. One thing is for sure, Satan sells. No matter how you slice it, it's not the heavy metal bands like Black Sabbath and Kiss that are losing money in the current record industry depression. In fact, some new groups seem to be picking up that satanic smell of success and following along in its path. The Lords of the New Church uh, is, uh, can be taken obviously a variety of ways in terms of the title and what it might imply and what their name is. I, I, first of all, I question how many of these bands, how many of these bands truly have a, a satanic motive, you know? And I think that what's, what, what goes on with anything uh, is that once the issue is brought up, people tend to try to look for those things and they'll try to place it and they'll say, aha, I see that that's implying some sort of a uh, religious or satanic uh, overtone. I think that within the rock music field, you've got people who really are into the occult and into Satan. Uh, and then you've got some who probably are playing games, but no matter how you cut it,
they're propagating Satan. They're propagating the demonic line, the occultic world, and I think it's a devastating thing on our culture. I don't think there's anything too evil about it. I don't want to, you know, grow up and, and be some devil worshiper because I've only believed in music all of my life. As far as any any message from uh, Satan or uh, the forces of evil are concerned, uh, that uh, I, it's funny. I really think. It, I that speaks of, of the culture abandoning its Christian roots. But in May of 1982, teenagers of a congregation in Topeka, Kansas, destroyed thousands of dollars worth of records and tapes, which they felt contained the message of Satan. The Christian concern sheds light on a more secular aspect of music listening. It's what you don't hear. Government investigation has found subliminal messages on certain albums when played in reverse. A bill now before Congress would require warning labels on those records containing backward masking. And that way, uh, uh, young people that don't want this kind of material, whether it's political messages that Reagan is a great guy or whether it has anything to do with, with Satan or Charlie Chan, uh, they're not going to have to uh, listen to it. Parents who go out to buy their kids, uh, the teeny boppers, uh, record albums during the Christmas period, uh, they will see uh, the warning label. What I've done here is queued up this song. It's called um, Fire on High from the ELO Face the Music album. Yeah. And I wouldn't have known about it. I mean, I, I've played this record a million times, and I've heard that you know what tape sounds like when it's running backwards. I've heard that there's something in here backwards, but I've never felt moved to put it on tape and run it backwards and see what it says. Well, it's real easy, this particular record, to just take your hand and, and go like this, and we'll hear what it says. The music is reversible, but time... Turn back. Turn back. See? The music is reversible, but time... Turn, turn back, back. Turn, turn back. back. What does that mean? I think it's a gimmick. I mean, it's, it's not... Uh, it doesn't seem too diabolical to me. I think it's just a gimmick. Gimmick? Maybe. Let's take a closer look at what some bands are really doing. You're listening to the number one requested song of the last 10 years, a familiar song. Some believe it deserves a warning label. Why? Listen to the song backwards. It's called Stairway to Heaven. I think just the very fact that this has gotten some attention may cause record groups to say, hey, uh, rather than get hassled by the feds, uh, let's do all this rotten satanic stuff forward. People say it's, it's, it's uh, Satanism. You can say we're a religion because when you have 5,000 kids all believing in this band, that is a religion. It is Satan carrying us further and further and further all the time. It's, you know, it's, it's selling your soul. Nobody's going to stop us. We're going straight to the top. We're red hot. Here it is, the greatest advance in television since color television itself. The ultimate in performance and convenience. Seven function remote control color television, so beautiful it enhances any decor. Clean, modern styling. No knobs or gadgets in sight. 
Superb cabinetry, master crafted of the finest woods. But the outstanding feature of this great new color set, the one big feature that sets it apart, is an amazing new wireless wizard electronic remote control. So perfected, you can operate every control, all seven functions, and each function is completely variable. Tint, color, brightness, volume, fine tuning, channel selection, on off. You can tune either with the remote unit from your easy chair or use the push button panel in the cabinet. Here, hidden, is the push button panel. It operates exactly in the same way as the wireless remote unit. These rocker bars control all of the necessary tuning functions. To use the seven function wireless wizard remote control, turn on the power for the remote amplifier at the set. From then on, the set is operative on remote push button tuning. This red button lights up and signals that the remote amplifier is on and ready for use. Take the remote unit from its handy storage space and you're set for hours of pure pleasure. Enjoy your favorite programs, black and white or color. Turn the set on, select your channel, See all color shows in living color. Once you've adjusted fine tuning for each channel, you never need touch fine tuning again, either at the set or on the remote unit. But if you want, touch. And you can adjust fine tuning to suit your taste at any time. If you overtune on this or any other control, just push the companion button to reverse the direction of the control. In the same way, press this rocker bar to adjust the color, variable all the way from black and white to maximum color intensity. To adjust the tint control for natural face tones, press the right rocker bar. Or the left. Let's you enjoy the picture you want the way you want to see it. Right at your fingertips, adjust brightness, lighter, darker. Like all the controls on this remote unit, the volume is fully variable. Select any volume you want. Should the telephone ring or guests arrive and you want to lower the sound for conversation, Turn the volume down to your taste. Or surround yourself with room filling four speaker sound. To change channels, press this bar. See all regular programs in crisp, clear, black and white. This selector button changes channels clockwise in ascending order to pre-selected local channels while this front window channel indicator lets you know at a glance what channel you're viewing, even from across the room. This button changes channels counterclockwise to lower numbered stations. When you want to turn off picture and sound, just press this button. It turns off the set amplifier, but the separate remote control amplifier is still on ready for you to return to any later program you wish to see. To turn off this separate remote amplifier, press this button on the push button panel. When the red pilot light is extinguished, you know both amplifiers are turned off. Yes, here is the ultimate in television, a supreme achievement in television engineering. A color set that puts RCA Victor Years ahead in dependable performance, armchair convenience, luxurious styling. A set where the pride of ownership is truly second only to the pleasure.
The following program is brought to you in living color. The whole earth will be brought to you in living color, visible and invisible. Your children's children will tell it how in the 20th century people went into space, saw the whole earth, and learned that we live on a rare and precious world. Space journeys have shown us other planets, barren and wasted, in startling contrast to our one and only Earth. Yet we face many problems, such as giving the world's people enough food to eat and enough clean air to breathe. We are starting to control visible pollution, but most pollution is invisible. How can we see all the kinds of pollution? We are increasing the yield of our farms. Still, we lose up to one-fifth of our crops every year through blight and disease, mostly invisible until it's too late. How can we see the sick crops in time? How can we see, looking down on the earth, the many invisible things which need to be seen? We can see them if we learn to sense not only the light which made these photographs, but also the hidden radiation constantly coming from the Earth, such as infrared and ultraviolet light. The light you see is recognized in terms of colors. And now, even that light you cannot see can be recognized in terms of other colors. Colors I call invisible colors. How can we use them to fight blight and disease, to fight pollution, to help understand and manage Earth resources? A new technology called multispectral sensing reveals invisible light in new ways. In these visible displays, colors can be assigned arbitrarily. For example, red is often used for infrared. In this film, you will see how our vision can be expanded. You will see how these technologies show us the whole Earth. And you'll see what kinds of problems can be solved. To start, Let's take a closer look at color. Here is a familiar object giving off more light than you can see. Infrared light, which you can feel as heat. In the electromagnetic spectrum, visible light is limited to a narrow band less than one octave wide. You see red light about 700 nanometers in wavelength. Other colors extend to violet about 400 nanometers in wavelength. You see less than one octave of light. How would it be if you could hear only one octave of sound? A player piano puts out a wide range of sound frequencies. hear over a range of eight octaves. A young person of high school age hears even more. Suppose you could hear only about one octave. Let's block off the notes, all except about one octave. eyes are limited to a one octave band of vision. And just as one octave is not enough to hear the full range of the player piano, so one octave is not enough to see what you need to see for Earth resources. One octave you see is a small part of the whole light spectrum. Here on a scale corresponding to the piano are the extra octaves of invisible color. Beyond violet, ultraviolet. Beyond red, infrared. 
several octaves are made visible by multispectral scanning. Sometimes in this film you hear sound tones corresponding to colors of specific frequencies, whether they are visible or normally invisible. For this low frequency light, a low frequency sound tone. We don't even have a name yet for this low frequency color because it has never before been seen in this fashion. Contrast the same place in an ultra high frequency image, another invisible color. Look at several different colors at the same time and sometimes in combination with photographs, which are usually limited to the narrow band of visible light. In the broad spectrum of visible and invisible colors, you can learn more from visible displays of multispectral imagery. Let's see how. You see your world of visible colors, as in this color television test pattern, by seeing combinations of certain basic colors. All these colors are made with just red, green, and blue. But when you sense a color, your eye cannot tell the bands that make up that color. When light of about 500 nanometers mixes with light of about 700 nanometers, you see an average, a light of about 600 nanometers, and you call it yellow. In a color mixture, the eye does not separate individual frequencies. In sound, your hearing does, something like multispectral sensing. We'll demonstrate using a Moog synthesizer, which makes music electronically. Like a tuning fork, the Moog generates pure tones of single frequencies. Here's a fundamental sound, frequency 500 hertz. Here is 700 hertz. Now, both at once. Do you hear them as an average? No. You can separate different sounds in a mixture. And so you can recognize a clarinet by its sound mixture, a pattern of frequencies. A flute has a different combination of the same frequencies. Its spectral pattern helps you to recognize it. An oboe has still a different combination of the same frequencies. Your hearing can recognize the differences. You are doing pattern recognition, something we can program a computer to do with the separately sensed colors in mixtures of light coming from objects on Earth. Using different combinations of multispectral images, we can learn to discriminate among the millions of different spectral patterns, each one caused by some object on the Earth radiating in a characteristic way. How are these technologies used to see the whole Earth, to manage Earth resources? First, we need a scanner. This one is a large aircraft scanner set up for ground test. Scanners can sense light far beyond the human eye and far beyond any lens or film. It's called a scanner because a rotating mirror scans the light from the Earth and sweeps it into a complex optical system. Here the light is split up in many different visible and invisible colors and is detected by sensitive instruments. Other kinds of multispectral scanners are mounted in unmanned spacecraft. Through solar paddles, these spacecraft draw energy from the sun. They observe the Earth from orbit for periods of one year and longer. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. satellite is launched into a polar orbit. With television-like cameras and multispectral scanners, the satellite orbits at about 900 kilometers in a sun-stabilized orbit. The Earth turns under it, 
so the systems can see the Earth in paths, the whole Earth every 18 days. Looking at the same area every 18 days shows changes in the Earth, both man-made changes and natural changes. To this unmanned satellite, it's always mid-morning on the Earth. A much larger satellite, Skylab, carries people into orbit for direct work with multispectral scanners and other sensing instruments. Inside Skylab, astronauts and scientists help to focus multispectral instruments on places of specific interest. It's a big Earth, and we want to be able to concentrate on areas of greatest value to the people on Earth. As a complement to the manned and unmanned recorders and instruments in orbit, other instruments, like this thermal mapper, are carried in aircraft, small and large. Instruments in aircraft observe in finer detail than satellites, but over much smaller areas. These flights combine the human factor, color film, radar, and other observations, along with multispectral scanning. Images are recorded electronically in such detail that the information on this one tape could overwhelm all the photo interpreters in the world if this tape had to be interpreted manually. Ground stations combine the computer's ability to handle large amounts of data with the investigative talent of people. Some tapes are read directly. Other tapes, recorded in orbit, are received at NASA stations by telemetry radio. These systems make images of the Earth you could never otherwise see. This must be done quickly, for some parts of the Earth change rapidly, as when snow and ice melt. Speed is also important so data from orbit can be compared with ground truth. Instruments similar to those in spacecraft and aircraft measure light from known objects for recognition of the same object elsewhere. What does it mean to have such multispectral capabilities using computers, spacecraft, aircraft with remote sensing instruments. What kinds of whole Earth problems can be solved with visible and invisible colors? Researchers and scientists carry on investigations in many fields. One problem we've mentioned, the loss of up to one-fifth of our crops every year due to infestation and disease. And in remote areas, entire forests are lost before we even realize it's happening. Here are invisible colors made visible for investigation and inventory. In this false color, the bright red patches help us to recognize healthy, growing rice crops. The blue patches are fields of burned grain stubble. Images such as these lead to more food and fibers through continuous inventories of timber, soil, and plants, and by recognition of crops. Here, for example, is a computer processed image which has separated just one kind of crop, winter wheat. Recognizing crops by spectral patterns in such images from space is a step toward inventory of the world's changing food supplies. Dense vegetation shows along the streams in the bright red of healthy crops. In contrast, sick crops will show darker because they have a different temperature, something like sick people. Sick crops can be located while there is still time to treat them. In a remote area of healthy vegetation, the satellite records a forest fire, perhaps unseen by people. Multispectral sensing can see exactly where the fires are, even through clouds of smoke. It can recognize the vegetation associated with mosquitoes, so you can treat with insecticide only where it will do good. You can avoid spraying insecticides where they're not needed. Other kinds of problems come in managing water and ice. Three-fourths of the Earth's surface is water, yet no country has enough water in the right places. This city on the ocean pipes in fresh water from rivers hundreds of miles away. Water is needed to irrigate agricultural fields. Water from snow-covered mountains can be useful it can also cause floods. Continuous inventory of water and melting ice, even in remote regions, means better management of water resources. We are locating the best spots to harvest the fish and other resources of the sea. 
other problems face us. What are the limits of Earth's capacity to support population and industrialization? People are becoming more concerned with the impact of accelerating technology on our natural world. Can thermal pollution be measured and controlled? Look within the mixture of colors, the infrared, the visible, and the ultraviolet. You are seeing industrial plants and the temperature of their discharges into rivers and lakes. Can you detect pollution by gases, sometimes invisible? And notice this international boundary where one nation's air pollution flows invisibly across the border into another nation. Can you measure pollution by solid waste? Recognizing acid waste, sludge, and sewage by their spectral responses is a step toward improving our environment. Geography problems include knowing how the Earth is changing due to natural causes and due to man-made causes. In this area of several states of dense population, you see much healthy vegetation. You can analyze changing land use, study urban areas, and control their development. Where are the world's mineral and land resources? What are the potential disasters, such as earthquakes and volcanoes? How can we manage our lands wisely? Multispectral images help to predict volcanic activities, also to locate and identify minerals. They locate faults in the earth that could lead to further earthquakes. You can reduce the impact of natural disasters on people and property in the United States and in other lands. Thousands of multispectral images and other data from spacecraft and aircraft. Images of your town and your land flowing to Earth for use by federal, state, and local governments. In agriculture and forestry, in oceanography and hydrology, in geology and mining, in geography and environmental sciences. Truly, Earth Resources is a whole Earth program involving many countries as well as groups of the United Nations. Information from space shared freely by the United States as requested by other nations to fit their part of the Earth. Information about weather and about Earth resources is transmitted electronically and distributed so that people in other lands can interpret the resources of their country. With multispectral systems, we are beginning the first steps to take a continuous running inventory of the whole Earth to increase food supplies by reducing losses due to blight and disease, and to help in cleaning the air we breathe, to help solve many problems on our precious Earth. We do not know yet all we will learn about Earth resources with these new instruments. Like Galileo's telescope, these systems will lead us to new discoveries which are not predictable. Systems for seeing many bands of visible and invisible colors, for seeing single frequency colors, and for recognizing spectral patterns found in the color coming from the whole Earth. Perhaps now you can see what you must do to the whole Earth so your children's children will be able to tell it.
clicking sounds, sounds that reveal the presence of radioactive rays. The instrument, a Geiger counter, is converting radioactivity into sounds we can hear. This radioactivity is coming from a small piece of radioactive material inside this plastic cylinder. The small amount of radioactivity coming from the cylinder is harmless. The luminous dial on this watch also gives off radioactive rays, which we hear on the Geiger counter. Even when there's no radioactive material near, the Geiger counter continues to click. This is caused by cosmic radiation that continually bombards us from outer space. But we don't get enough cosmic radiation to harm us. Today, atomic scientists produce radioactivity in large amounts. Radioactivity and radioactive materials have many peacetime uses. But we know too that they can be used harmfully, as in atomic bombs. The chance of your being hurt by an atomic bomb is slight. But since there is a chance, you must know how to protect yourself. To protect yourself, you have to know what the bomb does. Besides blast, there's radioactivity and heat. Can we protect ourselves from these? These children are protected. Concrete walls help stop radioactivity. Any wall stops the heat. The heat scorches the house, but does not harm the children. Any solid gives some protection. The thicker it is, the better. We have the national defenses to intercept an enemy, and we all form a team to help each other through emergencies. You are on that team. So is your family, each member of it. And in your community, every doctor, fireman, every policeman, and nurse, every lineman and operator, every civil defense worker, in fact, every community employee is ready to help you if you need him. So your community is prepared for emergencies and ready to help other communities. We have state and national headquarters for civil defense. And your city has a civil defense corps. We have a warning system and a system of defense. Yes, we have the equipment and the people for an effective team. But, like any team, it can win only when everyone knows his job and does it well. What is your job? What if a warning siren sounds? What should you do? Look for cover, the nearest cover. Don't try to make it home unless home is the nearest place to go. Don't hesitate, find cover. Everyone is in on this. Strangers will understand. Finding shelter quickly may save your life. If you can't get into a house, get behind a wall or a steep embankment on the side away from the city. Civil defense teams will go into action immediately. If you're home, you've work to do. Hi, Susie. Everything's fine upstairs. How are you doing here? Okay, I guess. That's good. We repeat, cover windows to protect against the possibility of broken glass, heat, and radioactivity. Turn off fires. If you are home and are not assigned to civil defense duties, go to your prepared shelter. Those who are in shopping centers, go to prepared well, shelters the immediately. Out. Now we'll go down the basement. In this practice alert, we are assuming that the attack will come on the waterfront area. See, it's just practice. All this rushing around for nothing. Now, there's just where you're wrong. We need this practice. Now, come on, let's do our job. That's good thinking. We all need practice. Here's a clean, well-prepared shelter in the basement. Ted and Sue have a battery radio. And they have soda ash and stirrup pump fire extinguishers. They have other emergency supplies, too. A flashlight, a well-equipped first aid kit, with plenty of bandages, tape and scissors. A Red Cross first aid book, a few cans of food, a good supply of water, blankets, and an electric lantern in reserve. You know, Susie, 
This stuff would come in handy on a camping trip. I'd a lot rather be on a camping trip. Say, what would we do if we didn't have a basement? At school, they told us we should be away from windows and behind double walls, you know, like an inside hall. Ted's right. If you live in an apartment house, you can't all go to the basement. Head for a shelter area. If none is marked for you, find cover away from windows and in a hallway if possible. Wait for the all clear. Be calm. If you're on the playground, run for shelter. If you're in the schoolyard, get into the building. Move quickly, but in good order. Inside, go to the shelter area you've been assigned. Take your place on the floor. Here's one good way to protect your eyes and neck in case of a bombing. Wait for the all clear. So far, you've been watching a practice drill. But what if there is a bombing, a bombing that comes without warning? What is your job then? Find cover immediately. Don't look at the flash. Stretch out. In about one minute, the immediate danger is past. Then head for safer cover. Another bomb may fall. Get indoors if you can. Shed your outer garments. They may have radioactive particles on them. If you're home, take shelter and stay down for about one minute. By then, the danger from radioactivity, heat and blast have passed. Protect your eyes and neck. Let's get things shut up. Sue found shelter under her bed. Dead. Let's get the battery set. When the house current is off, that battery radio is essential. Keep tuned in. The air burst of 3.01 p.m. was zeroed on Union Station. Heavy damage extends from about 14th Street North to as far south as the waterfront. <laughs> You know, we're lucky. To that blast was miles Stay undercover here. unless you have civil defense to... I've just been handed a bulletin. There's been an underwater burst at the waterfront. Water thrown up by the bomb is falling as mist and rain, and it is radioactive. Avoid radioactive mist and what rain. What do you mean by radioactive mist? The According to what Dad said, the radioactivity gets into the mist and rain. And if the mist or rain gets on you, it's apt to make you very sick. What would you do about it? I'd scrub thoroughly with a detergent and water. What's a detergent? It's something like Mom uses when she washes dishes and clothes. Don't drink tap water. It may be contaminated. Ted and Sue are waiting for the all clear. I'll see who it is. Hello, who's there? It's your block warden, Mr. Carlson. Good morning, Mr. Carlson. Hello, Ted. Hello. Ted, this is Mr. Franklin, our radiological monitor. He's here to check for any radioactivity. I saw your mother down in the shopping center. She's fine. Well, there's no damage here. No, it's been very good here. Hello, Sue. Say, have you seen my dad lately? He's down at headquarters, and boy, he's really busy. Yeah? Well, there's no radioactivity here. Say, Mr. Franklin, is that a pen on your coat there? Oh, no, that's a dosimeter. A dosimeter? Well, what's a dosimeter? Well, it measures the amount of uh, radioactivity that I've been exposed to. But this is the meter that I used to check with. Say, Mr. Carlson, is there anything I can do outside to help? No, Ted, everything is under control. You just stay here till the all-clear signal is given. You've done a good job. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Bye, Sue. Bye. Bye. A good Bye. job. That's what everyone must do to be safe. Doing a good job means simply following the rules in an alert or an attack and waiting until all is clear again. In this early and troubled stage of the atomic age, our very lives may depend on always being alert.
You are watching Sleepcore, media for sleep. Presenting VCR 2, the world's first dual deck VCR. With the patented dual deck system. Now, duplicating tapes is as easy as one touch of a button. Exclusive HQ Copy creates exceptional duplications, generation after generation after generation. You can edit commercials out of your videotapes with a few simple steps. A full function remote control puts the VCR2 features at your fingertips. On-screen programming makes it simple to change VCR2 settings. The VCR2 from Go Video. Other VCRs can imitate, but never duplicate. Ask for a demonstration. Okay, you're excited. You went ahead and got it. And now you're the proud owner of the new VCR2. If you're watching this tape, you've successfully hooked up your VCR2 to your TV set. And the automatic play feature is operating. Nice going. You're off to a great start. And that was easy, right? You're going to find everything about operating your VCR2 easy as pie with the help of this unique video manual in your simple-to-follow owner's guide. But before we go any further, you get a big pat on the back for purchasing the first and only dual deck consumer VCR on earth. And the only VCR that comes with a five-year parts and labor buyer protection plan. So again, congratulations, you've made a very smart purchase. Your VCR 2 does things no other VCR has ever been able to do. And in the next half hour or so, this video manual will help you become a VCR 2 expert. Now, let me tell you how to find your way around your video manual. The table of contents at the beginning corresponds to the numbers you'll see in the upper right-hand corner of your TV screen. When you want to find a specific section of the tape you're playing, press fast forward or rewind. This is called picture scan, and it lets you watch a tape at high speed. You can read more about this feature on page 12 of your owner's guide. When you see the numbers you're looking for, Press play. You can also look for the bright red screens that appear at the beginning of the section. You've probably already figured out that the remote control up there in the corner is showing you which buttons to push. And I'll also push the buttons on the front panel of the VCR2 so you can use either one. While you're watching this tape, don't actually push the buttons or things will appear on your screen that may confuse you. But by all means, if you want to try something, Stop the tape and do it. Okay, first things first, we're going to set the clock. Right off, you'll notice an obvious difference between your VCR2 and other VCRs. No blinking 12 o'clock. That blinking drives me crazy. It's sort of like a, a dripping faucet. Once you've set your clock, It'll stay set unless your power goes off, like during an electrical storm, for example. In fact, it's a good idea to unplug your VCR2 and other electronics during an electrical storm. 
to protect them from lightning surge. To set your clock, use your remote control. Your remote control makes it really simple to change settings on your VCR2 because it has these numeric buttons. I'll show you what I mean. First, you press the menu button, which is on the left side of your remote control. Remember, don't do this right now. If you look at your TV, you'll see the main menu. All the on-screen programming menus are listed here on the main menu. What is on-screen programming? Well, I'll tell you, it's a great feature of your VCR2 that makes it easy to view and change VCR2 settings right on your TV screen. It's pretty easy to find your way around, especially if you use those numeric buttons. See the line that says set date and time? That's the one I want, so I'll press 3. Now you'll see the calendar. That top line, set month, tells me what to do next. I punch in the month. 01 for January, 02 for February, 03 for March, and so on. Or I can use the up and down buttons to change the month like this. The month I pick shows up on the second line, and it's blinking so I can find it easily. When I've got it right, I press the next button over there on the left side of the remote control. Now I set the year. I go on through the day, the hour, the minute, and AM, PM. I can't use numbers for AM, PM, so I press the down button to change that setting. When I've got everything right, I press save to store my settings and return to the main menu. I press save again to make the main menu disappear. Now that was pretty simple, wasn't it? If you want to look over those instructions, check page 25 of your owner's guide. And if you want to try setting the clock, stop this tape and try it or you can rewind the tape and watch it again if you'd like. The time and day of the week now appear on the front panel of your VCR2. You can also see the time and date on the on-screen display, so let me show that to you. Another great feature of your VCR2 is the on-screen display, which shows up on your TV screen just about every time you push a button. It stays there for about six seconds and tells you what's going on with your VCR2. The upper left tells you what deck one is doing, and the upper right tells you what deck two is doing. The middle section tells you what you're watching, and down at the bottom are the date and time. If you change the recording source, which I'll tell you about later, the date and time disappear, and you'll see these blocks in the bottom corners that tell you what deck one and deck two are ready to record. Page 28 of your owner's guide will tell you more about on-screen display. Now let me show you some of the amazing things you can do with your dual deck system. Of course the dual deck system has all the features you'd expect, like playing a tape or recording a TV program. You can read instructions for those features in the owner's guide. I'm going to show you the things that only you and your VCR2 can do. And we're going to start with duplicating a tape. Duplicating a tape is one of the simplest things you can do on your VCR2. Now watch this. I put my pre-recorded tape, like this video I shot on my ski trip, into deck one. I put my blank tape into deck two. I press the copy tape button. Now I can run out to the kitchen and make myself a sandwich or I can watch anything I want on TV and I end up with an exceptional quality duplication and all I had to do was press one button, copy tape. Now that's one great button. It's really that simple and you can learn more tips to make your duplications even better like recording onto high quality tapes by reading page 13 of your owner's guide. If you have a blank tape handy, try duplicating a few minutes of this video manual. You can rewind this tape and watch the steps again if you need to. Now, I uh, want to remove that embarrassing scene that's coming up. I uh, fell down. Uh, no problem. I'm already duplicating my tape with the copy tape button. When that scene starts, I just press the pause button on deck two. Deck 1 keeps playing, but Deck 2 stops recording. When I'm back on my skis, I press the Deck 2 record button again, and the duplication continues.
That's how easy it is to edit out scenes on your VCR too. This, is, but this, and this is a home. And this is a home. Wherever you go in the wide world, you know that there are many animals about you. Sometimes you can see them. Sometimes you can't. Many will hide from you because they're afraid you might hurt them. And they build their homes where they'll be hidden or where enemies will have a hard time reaching them. The cliff swallows build nests high out of reach under an overhanging rocky ledge. They gather mud in their beaks and fly back with it to make their homes. High on a cliff, they can raise their families safe from the weather above and from danger below. Each kind of bird has its own way of protecting its nest. Some, like the red-winged blackbird, make their homes beside a pond where they'll be hidden in the tall reeds. Many birds build their nests in the branches of a tree. Some nest on the ground. And some are even able to make a hole in a tree trunk. The reason for the nest is the same, to have a home to raise a family. And all families are the same. They have big appetites. It's hard to believe that in only four weeks these scrawny little birds will be big enough to fly out into the big world. They won't need a home for another year when they'll build nests to raise families of their own. What other reasons are there for having a home? Have you ever stopped to think what ants use their home for? Well, for one thing, they use it as a place to store food. These worker ants are taking seeds down into their underground storerooms. Ants live together, sometimes many thousands in one colony. Down in their long underground tunnels, they're safe from their enemies. Here are ants working to make the tunnels longer. And way up at the top of the picture is another ant who's trying to move a big pebble. Each ant in the colony has its own job. These are the nurses that take care of the young ones. The babies are white at this stage. They can't move or take care of themselves. Does it seem to you that ants build a good, safe place to raise their young and store food and live their lives? Many kinds of spiders build homes. You've all seen big round spider webs, but here's a different kind, one with a tunnel to hide in. The spider spins a flat web out in front of the tunnel to trap food. Spiders are helpful because they kill so many of the insects that bother us. Close by, this spider has built another web where she's laid her eggs. After the baby spiders hatch, the web is their home until they're big enough to build their own. We've all seen homes built by spiders and ants and birds, but not many of us know about a gallfly's home. Out in the woods, you may have seen strange round things on trees or bushes. These grow wherever the gallfly lays an egg in the bark. When the egg hatches, the young one has a fine home to grow in complete with food and protection from its enemies.
When it's grown to the right size, it makes a hole and crawls out to live the rest of its life. Who do you think this is making a tunnel just under the surface? A mole. You won't often see a mole. Most kinds live underground all their lives and can't even see if they're brought out into the light. Look at those short, strong front legs that he uses for digging. And that long, sharp nose that tells him where his breakfast is. He'd much rather get back to his home underground. Watch how fast he can dig. A great many animals make their homes underground. Here's another fellow, a gopher. He builds a bigger tunnel than the mole does, so he has to push some of the dirt up to the surface. Watch how he pushes with his chest and front legs. A gopher never goes far from his tunnel even to look for food. When he runs out of food in one place, he digs underground to another place. This way he may dig a tunnel a mile long in a year. That's a long home, isn't it? For some animals, a tree is a favorite place to live. An old hollow tree is a home ready-made to move in and start housekeeping. That scraggly-looking creature is a mother possum. She's carrying something on her back. Do you know what it is? It's her family of young possums. Riding on mother is rough going. A fella has to hang on tight if he doesn't want to get tossed off. Why do you suppose a mother possum puts up with this? Well, when you were a baby, your mother used to take you with her when she left the house. A mother possum doesn't leave her babies home alone either. She takes them along even though they grab hold with all four paws and their teeth. Hang on now. They made it. Home again. Here's another mother doing what mothers so often do. Making the bed and tidying up around the home. This animal is called a coatamundi. Coati for short. Like other mothers, she has young ones that sometimes interfere with the housework. Does anything like this ever happen around your home? Thank you.
It's fun to play, but it's good to have a home to go to when the play is over. Would you like to learn more about the way animals live? Do you know whether bears have homes? Would you be surprised to find out that deer and many other animals have no homes at all? And what about fish? Do they have homes? Do you know how bees live? What do you know about rabbits? And squirrels? And mice? Where does the coyote go when he's tracked down his dinner? And where does the mountain lion go when he's finished his? You'll want to know more about a home and what it means. Without a home, many could not live at all. A home is a safe place and a good place. baby is an exciting addition to the family. But there are problems, too. He's always asleep. When's he ever going to be any fun? All he ever does is eat and sleep. Yes, eat and sleep. And that's just about all you did, too, when you were a baby. You had to depend on your mother for all the things that you needed. She had to feed you, to bathe you, to put you down to sleep. As you grow older, you learn to do more and more things for yourself. Some of these things you do so often that they become habits. Everybody has habits. Dad likes to read his newspaper every evening in this same chair. It's one of his habits. Habits are things you do naturally without having to think about them. Martha first had to think each step when she tied a bow knot. Now she can do it easily and quickly. Regular habits make daily living much easier since they help us do things without having to think about them. Some of the habits you learn now may stay with you all your life. All right, children. It's time to get ready for bed. I'm almost through with this chapter, Mother. It's time for bed, Susie. You go right to sleep now. Getting ready for bed at a regular time is one of the most important habits you can learn. A quiet hour or two before bedtime is part of this habit. It makes you feel relaxed and sleepy, ready for bed. Washing up is part of the going to bed habit. Any regular routine before bedtime helps you feel sleepy. Hanging up your clothes can be part of this routine. They'll air out overnight and be neat for tomorrow. Wearing the right kind of night clothes is important. David's pajamas fit him loosely and don't bind him around the waist. David likes to open his window, when it isn't too cold, for fresh air, but he's careful not to sleep in a draft. Of course, Martha has her own habits. Instead of opening her window, she gets fresh air by opening her door a bit. Good night, David. Good night, sis. David's bed is comfortable and the mattress isn't too soft. The covers on his bed are warm without being heavy. And so David's ready for bed at just about the usual time. Of course, he sometimes stays up later, but that doesn't happen often enough to change his going to bed habits. Now to sleep. Some people go right to sleep, others take longer. Because David has regular sleeping habits, he usually drops off very quickly. Mm. 
David has probably never stopped to think what a wonderful thing sleep is. In sleep, the muscles of the body are relaxed. It's the most perfect way to relax that we have. Our breathing is slower and deeper when we sleep. The body's temperature is lower. Even the heart beats more slowly. The whole body is resting. To rest all our muscles, we turn in our sleep. Some people turn often, others not so often, but we all do it. It's a normal part of sound, healthy sleep. Dreams are normal too. Often they're suggested by things around us while we sleep. don't seem to make much sense, do they? That's because the brain is resting along with the body, so it's less alert when you sleep. After a good night's sleep, you usually wake up easily and naturally. The alarm hasn't rung yet. David finds that he usually wakes up before it goes off. Of course, it takes him a little while to get fully awake. You're never at your best until at least an hour or two afterwards. That's one reason why getting up early is so important. There's plenty of time for breakfast, too. Breakfast is an important meal that shouldn't be missed. If you usually go to bed early enough, you usually wake up early, too. You can start the day in a pleasant, unhurried way. It's more fun for you that way, and more fun for the rest of the family, too. David and Martha enjoy their mornings, and that helps them enjoy the whole day. As the day goes on, you get more and more value from your regular sleeping habits. Plenty of sleep helps you to be bright and alert to the very end of the day. But what about bad sleeping habits? George just doesn't get enough sleep. And now in the afternoon, he's tired. It's hard for him to pay attention in class. When the teacher calls on him, George just can't seem to remember things that he really ought to know. George doesn't realize it, but his main trouble is bad sleeping habits. Last night, for instance... No, no, Muggsy. Don't rub me out. I didn't do it. Honest, I didn't. No rat's gonna squeal on me. You know too much, Limpy. You know I wouldn't sing, Muggsy. We've been pals too long. Slats saw you in the DA's office. Sure, I was there, but, but, but they didn't get nothing out of me. Then why was the coppers around here today? I don't know, Muggsy. I don't know. You squealed, that's why. You put the finger on me. You can't do it, Muggsy. You can't. You can't. Oh. Oh. Yes, George has bad sleeping habits. And even when he finally does get into bed, he finds it hard to go to sleep. That's because he hasn't formed the habit of going to sleep at a regular time each night. And it's just as hard for him to wake up in the morning. George! George! Get up, George! He's still tired because he hasn't had enough sleep. George, close the door. 
The morning starts badly, and the whole day goes badly when you get too little sleep too often. And even after class is over, you keep on paying the penalty for bad sleeping habits. You don't have much fun when you're tired and low in energy. Lack of sleep makes it hard for you to do your best. You just can't seem to get into the game and have fun the way the other fellows do. You're irritable and cross, hard to get along with. People don't like you, and you don't like yourself when you're like that. Probably neither David nor George realize how important their sleeping habits are to the way they enjoy their waking hours. Going to bed at a regular time each night makes it easier for you to go right off to sleep instead of lying awake long into the night. You wake up easily and naturally without having to be dragged out of bed. And most important, your day starts right and stays right. Both David and Martha have learned that good sleeping habits help you get the most out of everyday living. truly beautiful land. Within our 50 states found counterparts of all the world's natural grandeur. This scenic beauty constitutes one of our nation's great resources, the heritage of natural splendor, which we must preserve for those who come after us. We Americans have made great strides in the protection of most of our natural resources. Under this concept, for example, we raise more wood than we use in the lumber and pulp industries because we grow trees like a crop. To help conserve another vital natural resource, we are also constantly developing more efficient methods to mine and process our mineral-bearing ores. Conservation-minded oil companies use scientific spacing and advanced recovery methods in the drilling of wells, thus to ensure the wisest use of our petroleum reserves. We practice the conservation of water resources. For irrigation, which has turned dry, barren deserts into vast productive gardens, When it comes to the conservation of most natural resources, we are a responsible people. We want to conserve our natural wealth. We cannot leave to the generations who will follow us an empty and wasted land. To the best of our ability, we must pass on to them the land of natural riches that we enjoy in our time. But there is one rich heritage that we use in a different, more personal way. This is the America of land and water, the glorious outdoors which we use for recreation. This too, we must regard as a great resource. We all enjoy this scenic heritage in our own way. 
We may rest our eyes and our hearts by a rippling stream or a quiet lake. We can meet some of the natives too, remembering that they were here before us and that they have a stake in the future of our open country. We can follow the sun to the beach, or we can enjoy ourselves in a more active way. We can do even better. We can capture wind and wave and bring them home with us on canvas. Those without the artist's touch can still capture nature's beauty the simple way. Some of us prefer the quiet stroll along wooded pathways, while others prefer the challenge of an exclusive view. This land of ours, this inspiring resource of beauty and space, is a fountainhead from which we draw new energy and enthusiasm for the tasks that lie ahead. In a large and very real sense, America's scenic and recreation areas are one of our most important natural resources. But while we're a responsible people with regard to our tangible resources of forests and minerals, how do we treat this important resource for recreation? We go away from home on a vacation and take a holiday from responsibility. We launch a fallout of litter. problem seems to get worse. Sadly and ironically, because of scientific advances and new improvements in modern living, trash only becomes trash after it has first served a useful purpose. It becomes litter only after people thoughtlessly discard it. The art of modern packaging has helped to make our outings even more enjoyable. Almost anything we need is conveniently available. But it is these wonderful packages, cans, bottles, and paper containers thoughtlessly discarded, which we carelessly convert to litter across the face of our country. As highway miles increase and roads grow better, wider, smoother, leading to ever more interesting places, more and more of us are taking advantage of our great resources for recreation. Yes, with modern automobiles, an expanding highway system, and an increasing amount of leisure time, we go our happy way, spreading more litter in more places than ever before. And although considerable time and money have been spent to provide roadside litter containers, many a traveler still tries to hit them from moving automobiles. The average motorist for this kind of marksmanship is no Annie Oakley. This is not only a legal violation, but more importantly, an offense to the laws of decency. And not only do we Americans litter public property, which might be considered our own, but we invade private lands as well. You'd be surprised and shocked to find a party of strangers littering your front lawn, yet has it occurred to you that many people will do what amounts to the same thing on private property where they've gone to hike, fish, or hunt. has always had an affinity for a lake or a stream and for the continuing enjoyments they offer. 
Reclamation projects in many parts of our beautiful land have created scores of new water playgrounds. With a multitude of new marinas available, thousands of enthusiasts have a reason for wanting a boat. The interest in water fun is booming, but so is the accumulation of litter. Water litter is not only unsightly, floating debris can be dangerous, even tragic. And litter can be a very real danger on land as well as water. The growth of winter sports brings out legions of happy enthusiasts. Many of these snow-loving sportsmen help make litter a year-round problem. When rubbish is discarded in the winter snow, Wildflowers are not all that bloom in the spring. In many areas, the growth of our civilization has changed the landscape. But much of the beauty of the North American continent is just as the discoverers and pioneering settlers found it. Except for the special touch we have added. There was a time when the ruthless cutting of timber threatened to denude our land. When we ripped the earth apart in our quest for gold. And when we overdrilled our oil fields. When our water ran wild and destructive to waste itself in the sea. But as responsible Americans, we did something about it. Through a continuing program of public education, we are learning to protect the nation's wealth of natural resources all except our priceless resources for recreation. The need has become critical for us to protect and preserve the lovely land we hold in trust for future generations. The time has come to do something. And by a strange paradox, this is really the easiest of all national problems to solve. Instead of going on the ground or into the water, discards go into a litter bag. Any grocery sack will do, or a cardboard box. Where there are trash receptacles, let us use them. If a public litter container is not available, there's always the one at home. For the car, Plastic or other permanent litter containers are inexpensive, simple to install, and best of all, easy to use. When it comes to litter, you can take it with you. What can we do to beat the litter bug habit? Two things. Individually, we can make an effort to avoid littering and set a good example for impressionable people, such as the younger generation. Next, we should remember that group effort is simply individual effort multiplied. Many responsible organizations are sponsoring cleanup campaigns in an effort to solve the litter problem. Youth organizations are also becoming aware of the problem and are campaigning on many fronts.
Responsible organizations such as Keep America Beautiful Incorporated, who are sponsoring educational campaigns, and others who are providing disposal facilities, have shown that the war against litter can be won. Among individual efforts, it's well to remind hunters and fishermen that they can do themselves a favor by always asking permission to use private lands. They repay the owner's kindness by cleaning up and taking their litter with them. Visitors who leave their litter behind can turn a welcome into a lockout. In fact, the lockouts have already started. In more than one locality, a public trout stream has become closed because of the expense of cleaning up litter left by careless fishermen. In other areas, stretches of beach have been closed because of a few people who can't remember their manners. As the situation grows worse and the cleanup costs continue to mount, wouldn't it be a shock to find closed signs on public recreation areas? While this extreme situation hopefully will never happen, it does point up one fact that is immediate. As taxpayers, we pay dearly and in many ways for our messy habits. The United States Forest Service alone budgets two and a half million annually for its house cleaning job in the national forests after the citizens depart. The total national bill for litter cleanup is now estimated at $500 million a year. Authorities also tell us that 60,000 brush and forest fires a year can be traced to the trash and litter problem, where dry litter is easily ignited by discarded matches or burning tobacco. And 30% of these fires are caused by people attempting to burn accumulated trash and litter in wooded areas. Our beloved country is faced with many complex problems, but solution of the litter habit surely is not one of them. We can solve that one ourselves, you and I. We need live only by a simple creed. Let no man regret that I passed here. Let us remember that America, the beautiful land, is not ours alone. This is our land, but it's ours only for the time being. It belongs also to those who are very close to us and to people whom we will never know. They too are entitled to continued enjoyment of our great outdoors. This heritage of splendor belongs to our children, to the generations of the future, on down the years for decades and centuries to come. America belongs to them too. It's not ours to waste and to despoil. We hold this land in trust, a trust we dare not carelessly betray. Our great scenic splendors are one of our most vital resources, deserving of devoted care and protection. The challenge is so great, and the solution so simple, let's not fail. And as we conquer the problem of litter, we and all the generations of the long future will be rewarded with endless enjoyment and renewed inspiration. Let's keep America the land of beautiful tomorrows. It's been lovely being here with you, dear. It is with regret 
I have to go I'll be thinking of you Don't you fear, dear With a happy heart that loves you so Pleasant dreams To you This is television station WDIV, Channel 4, owned and operated by Post Newsweek Stations Michigan Incorporated, with studios located at 622 Lafayette Boulevard, Detroit, Michigan. The programs of WDIV, the Post Newsweek station in Detroit, are intended primarily for home reception and otherwise may not be used without permission from WDIV television. As we begin this broadcast day, WDIV signs on the air by presenting these inspirational words. In this scientific age, the majority of 